Welcome to My Face, My Story, Voices from the Craniofacial Community, with your host, Dina Zuckerberg. Hello and welcome. You are tuned into My Face, My Story, Voices from the Craniofacial Community. We are a group of peers that see each other, hold space for one another, and support each other as we navigate life while living with facial differences, like Clark Griffin Powett, APRIS syndrome, and Treacher Collins syndrome. And don't forget to click subscribe so that you'll never miss a future episode. I am Dina Zuckerberg, Director of Family Programs at MyFace. I was born with a Clark grip, a hearing loss, and no vision in my left eye but it has never stopped me from doing anything I've wanted to do in my life. I had six surgeries, years of orthodontics, and speech therapy growing up. I was teased in school. Kids would say mean things, and I would sit alone sometimes on the school bus and in the lunchroom. I always say there is power in the shared story in knowing you are not alone. So anyone out there like me, I see you. We all do. It's about people like us being seen and heard, about sharing stories from the craniofacial community. This is a safe space, a space where the voices of the craniofacial community are heard. Thank you so much for joining us for a conversation with sisters Sarah and Charmaine Cooper. We will explore having a sibling with a facial difference, humor and community. But first, I would like to introduce our special guest. Charmaine Cooper was born in Jamaica and was born with Treacher Collins syndrome and deafness. She underwent reconstructive surgeries throughout her childhood in three countries, Jamaica, England, and the United States. At age three, Charmaine underwent surgery to restore some hearing in the left ear that allowed Charmaine to wear a hearing aid. Currently, Charmaine is a nurse practitioner lead at Adventist Healthcare in Maryland and has worked in the nursing profession for 22 years. In April 2020, Sarah went viral with her brilliant satirical lip sync impressions of the former president, which have been seen by tens of millions of people. Sarah's first variety special, Sarah Cooper, Everything's Fine, premiered on Netflix in 2020 to rave reviews and featured a number of high profile celebrity came cameos. Sarah was named one of Variety Magazine's 10 comics to watch for 2020 and Vulture Magazine's The Comedians You Should and Will Know in 2020. And she also guest hosted Jimmy Kimmel Live in August, 2020. Prior to her online success, Sarah also wrote the best-selling book, 100 Tricks to Appear Smart in Meetings. Sarah is next set to pen an autobiographical take of Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People for Audible. Welcome, Charmaine and Sarah. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having us. This Thank is really you. exciting. I've never done anything with my sister before like this, so. This wow. is fun. <laughs> I love it. I'm so glad we're doing this. Especially Actually, I have, I, have, I, have a, I have a gift. I have a little thing that I found very recently. I don't know if Charmaine remembers this. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember that very well. That is too funny. So what is but, it? Okay. okay, so this is a contract that I wrote between me and myself that I would try to be an actress. And if you look at the date, it's literally 26 years ago yesterday. Wow. <laughs> and I, I, oh, I, I, I had Charmaine um, <laughs> be my witness. <laughs> wow. I love so. that. <laughs> that is too funny. I love it. Oh my yeah. she's, she's always been like very supportive of, of everything that I've done. And I've tried I to be supportive it. of her as well. Yeah. So um, are you, so do you have other siblings? Um, is yes. That to you? Yeah. I have, we have, well, I'm the youngest. And then so we have our brother, uh, George, and then Charmaine, and then our other sister, Rachel. Okay. Yeah. 
So, Charmaine, can you start us off by sharing with us a little bit about your craniofacial difference and how it has impacted you growing up? I was born with Treacher Collins syndrome, deafness, and cleft palate. Um, I was born in Jamaica. When I was born, the doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. Uh, they told my mom that they were, I had facial deformity. My ears were not developed. Um, growing up, it was a challenge being different. Um, I've undergone a lot of surgeries, as you mentioned in the uh, introduction, um, throughout my childhood. And um, my parents treated me like a regular kid. Even though I was born deaf, um, they raised me as oral. What that means is I learned how to lip read. Uh, so I was able to lip read. And kids were not nice to me. You know, they stared, they made fun. Um, but you would have to think I was deaf also. So a lot of the things that they said, I didn't hear. I would hear from my other friends who heard um, what was being said. So um, that was that was a challenge uh, growing up and being different from other kids. Uh, I'm wondering, so you said you lip read and so I too was born with a hearing loss and I hear nothing on the right and we're hearing it in my left ear. And so I was wondering if you found it like I did particularly difficult during the pandemic when everyone was wearing a mask. Um, I know for myself, because I do read lips, I found it really challenging. So I was wondering if you experienced that as well. It was unbelievably challenging. I'm completely deaf in my right ear. They were gonna try to do surgery with the right ear, but I have nerve damage, so they couldn't touch the right ear. So I'm completely deaf in the right ear. Wearing the mask and I rely on lip reading, that was really hard. I have a, an awesome audiologist I had to see to adjust my hearing aid settings so that I can hear better. But oftentimes I ask people to repeat what they're saying or stand on my left side. Um, I tend to have conversations in more of a, a quiet setting. Um, mm -hmm. That has helped a little bit um, through the pandemic, but it's, yeah, we still have to wear masks, so it's it's still a challenge, but I kind of, you know, figure out a way to work around it. Yeah, I, I can totally relate. I had to, exactly what you said, I, I had to ask people to repeat a lot because, and I, I guess I still do when I'm wearing a mask because it's just so hard. I know they were making masks where you could see through it, uh, which I think was probably really beneficial for people. I did not get one of those, but it's probably, would have helped. I would have actually liked it for other people to wear that so I could. Right. You know, <laughs> exactly. saying, um, yeah, you, you will see that in the OR and the surgical settings, you will tend to see those clear masks because oh, the, the deaf nurses need to be able to communicate with the surgeons when they're passing, you know, um, tools. So, and then are, there, so, are there a lot of deaf nurses? There are, um, I know a number of um, deaf nurses um surgical nurses yes and that's why with the um that's why i can't remember who but they did the uh, the clear face mask particularly for the or and the surgical settings for that reason i have to confess one of the things i was so nervous during the pandemic when the fear that i would end up in the hospital and somehow i would not like my hearing aid battery would die or something would happen and i wouldn't be able to communicate that and so, I, and then everybody else, I wouldn't be able to understand them. So I, I started to really think about, okay, I, did I have my hear, extra hearing aid? Do I have the batteries? I had everything sort of there. So I knew if, I, and if that should heaven forbid had happened, I would have been able to take that with me. And I, you know, in writing down like what I would want to communicate with them. So I, I have know. batteries everywhere. I have batteries in my bedroom, at my office, in my purse, in my fridge. Yes batteries everywhere. Yes, exactly. The, the batteries, I'm like, oh shoot, I have to go up to CVS and get more hair in <laughs> They're not cheap, yeah. so yeah, yeah. So um, Sarah, what was it like for you to have a sister who had a facial, has a facial difference? Um, I think for when I was little, I didn't realize that there was anything different about Charmaine. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it was, this was just what my sister, you know, looked like. That was my sister Charmaine. Um, so I don't think I was very kind to her growing up. I think we got into a lot of fights. Um, I don't, you know, I didn't treat her with kid gloves. I wasn't like, oh, you know, be nice to Charmaine. And then I think that, you know, I was, you know, I was a little brat. Um, youngest children sometimes are <laughs> little brats. Um, but I do remember, you know, the first time I, um, you know, I was walking through a mall and, you know, uh, kids were staring and it just made me so angry. And I didn't know what to do except just try to stare back at them and just like, you know, try to intimidate them with my eyes. But um, it just it made me really, really angry. Um, but I think, too, I just didn't understand what Charmaine was going through. Um, I remember going to the hospital after one of your surgeries at uh, Johns Hopkins and um, you were all bandaged up and I couldn't see you and I just started crying and then I think it was mom or dad somebody like took me out of the room and said you can't cry you got to be strong for Charmaine and I was like what I can't cry <laughs> you know I didn't understand what was going on um, and then you know she came home and I wanted to play with her and I took her out to play but then I was like wait a second maybe maybe that's gonna hurt her if I take her out to play after the surgery. So then I asked my dad after the fact, is it okay if I take Charmaine outside? And he was like, no, don't take her outside. You know, mm -hmm. the dust might get into her, you know, um, stitches. And then I felt like, I thought Charmaine was gonna die because of me. I literally thought wow. that she was gonna die because me, I took her outside. And it, it like really, really made me so scared and sad. And I didn't know who to really talk to about that. Um, so I just kind of just, I just decided that Charmy was going to die and it was going to be my fault. And then, and then when she didn't die, I was like, okay, good. I, did, I didn't kill my sister. <laughs> you know? So growing up, I always thought Sarah is this perfect child. You know, you look at her, there's nothing wrong with her. Um, I taught myself sign language. Um, as I mentioned before, my parents raised me as oral. So I learned how to lip read, but I secretly taught myself sign language and Sarah wanted to come and want me to teach her sign language. And I said, no, I, I'm not teaching you sign language. You know, finally in my head, I have something that Sarah does not have. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, now I understand. Now Sarah I understand. has no problems. I have a thousand problems <laughs> and I have something that Sarah does not have. So yeah, she so, really wanted me to learn. I said, no. I did not teach. I, that's so funny. I, I did. I did want to learn it. I remember Charmaine um, performed for the entire high school. She did um, the greatest love of all Whitney Houston. Oh, wow. And she 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 did the, the sign of the greatest love of all. You know, she did the whole sign. And I was remembering, you know, lonely. I remember lonely place. I remember a few things from that because I was like, I'm going to I'm going to figure this out. I'm gonna <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so I just want to take a mo minute to remind our live viewers that you can also ask your questions in the live chat right now, and we'll ask them later in the program. Uh, so did your parents know that you would be born with a difference, or was it, 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 was a, was it a su surprise? So it was a surprise. Back then, they didn't have um, ultrasound, so nice. they did not know. Um, the doctors didn't know what I was born with until later. Um, there's no one in our family um, that has Treacher Collins. So it's as a result of a uh, mutational um, defect um, in the chromosome. So that's, you know, what caused uh, me to have um, Treacher Collins. So no, they did not. Yeah, they did not know um, what was going on uh, with me. Um, it was someone I, I went to a, a school. Um, I have to share the story because I, mm -hmm. I find it really um, poignant. Um, in Jamaica, it's called St. Christopher School. And it's uh, called the School for the Deaf and Dumb. And yeah. it's not that because they thought deaf people were dumb. It's because they placed kids that could not hear and could not speak. So I was placed at that school because... I could not hear and I could not speak. Um, and someone there who was ahead of that school, um, somehow an opportunity came for me to go to England. There was someone in a surgeon in England who was 
familiar with Chicha Collins. And that's mm -hmm. how I started my um, surgical journey, if you will, at age three um, to England, starting up with my surgeries. Okay. Um, so can you imagine I was at this school, I could not hear and I could not speak. Um, that was uh, quite, I, quite I feel like that's, that's something that really hit me recently was, you know, you couldn't hear, you could only see, and you look different than everyone else, but you didn't have this extra thing that you could do. Like if you were blind and you didn't know what you look like, you didn't know what anybody looked like, it seems like that would almost be easier than not even being able to hear, but only being able to see. And having that be your only sort of representation of, of what you are in the world. And so I feel like that must have been so hard. And I just recently asked Charmaine, this is this is so funny. I just recently asked Charmaine about the first time she heard. Because we've mm -hmm. all seen those clips of the little kid the first time yeah. of the year and how like overwhelming. She had that experience. She had that experience. Yeah. And it was it was an ABBA song, right, sis? It was an ABBA it was, song. It was, it was an ABBA song. And when she yeah. heard the music, that's when she fell in love with dancing and wanted to dance because she had never heard music before. Yeah. And I'm her little sister thinking, oh, Charmaine's such a great dancer. I'm going to be a dancer. So <laughs> I, I wanted to just do everything that she did, but I didn't like dancing that much. So I quit right. dance you know, immediately. But I uh, just recently, like almost a month ago, didn't realize how powerful music is for Charmaine because she it's something she wasn't born with. It was something that was right. so precious, you know, that she they a three year old kid. They had to drill a hole in her skull into a three year old child's skull. Wow. I mean, it, it's it's amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah. So. I learned uh, as I got older that I, so I also, and I guess the year I was born, they didn't do this. So they didn't do hearing tests when I was born. And so I too did not apparently hear anything until I got my hearing aid when I was three years old. Um, I, unlike Charmaine though, do not remember the first time I heard. I can, and I guess because there was a photo, I think I saw once that I can kind of picture where it might've been but I don't really remember much more beyond that. So, but I imagine, I mean, cause if I take my hearing aid out, I basically hear almost nothing. So right. I can only imagine what that must be like. And in fact, I always wonder if there was a connection. My parents, I think I went to a neurologist who basically said that I would probably never be able to ride a bike and, and, and run and speak and all these sort of things. And I always wondered if maybe the, the fact that I couldn't hear was why I wasn't speaking, which is why they were making those assumptions. So mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of misdiagnosis, I think, especially, you know, back in the seventies when they really didn't know right. what was going on. Didn't, I mean, I think they told my mom that you weren't going to survive more than right. three months or something like that. And look at you now, she's turning 50 <laughs> this year. So, I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Sarah, what was it like for you? I mean, you talked a little bit about it, but what was it um, like for you when, so uh, let me actually go to Charmaine, and what was it like for you in school uh, in terms of, is there a moment, like, so did the kids pick on you? Did they exclude you? Did they stare? And what was that like for you? Yeah, the kids, yeah, they made fun of me. They stared a lot of times, um, they stared. Um, I was not bullied. I mean, I hear these horrific stories today of bullying that's taken place, violent and fatal, um, with fatal outcomes. But I was not uh, bullied. I think one person shoved me and I just shoved them back. Um, but other than that... Um, I didn't know about that. Yeah, I shoved them back. It was fine. Um, so they, they would stare and things of that nature. Um, I was in a, what you called an auditory program when I came to the United States. They actually put me back like a year and a half because I couldn't speak and, you know, again, I couldn't hear um, very well. So I was in the auditory program up until ninth grade until I got into the regular classes, mainstream. Um, yeah. I think it was in um, ninth grade and I had to do speech 
therapy. That was my least favorite thing to do. I had to look, stare at myself in the mirror and look at my mouth and see how my mouth, my lips move, where to put my tongue. I still have certain troubles with certain words up until this day, but oh, I did not like speech therapy. Oh my goodness. It was, but it was helpful, you know, in the end it, it helped, but, um, but yeah, so the auditory program, that was easy. When I got into mainstream, I was making all A's in the auditory program because the classes were a little easier. But then when I got into mainstream, oh man, I was making B's and C's for like the first quarter, uh, first couple of quarters. And then I realized I have to study so hard. I have to study, and I know I'm exaggerating, but I have to study like a hundred hours a week. Um, and I think it's because being born deaf and the delayed speech development, of course, reading comprehension, I really struggled uh, with that as well. So I, I had to study really hard um, in school because of that. I think in some ways, sometimes I think our difference makes us so much more um, willing to work hard and more resilient and more um, persevering, you know, always sort of, uh, I think, I think that's true. We actually have a question from Joanne Smith wanting to know, is Treacher Collins syndrome hereditary? It can be, yes. Um, in my case, it was not. It was a result of a defect. Uh, my mom was sick um, in her you know, early pregnancy. So in my case, it's not, but it can be, yes. Yeah, and I think if you, if I'm remembering correctly, if you are born with Treacher Collins syndrome, you then have a 50-50 chance of passing it on to your That's my understanding, child. yes. Yeah. So, um, so I talk to kids in school about being an upstander for someone, not just a bystander. So being a active upstander, not just a passive bystander. And um, and standing up for someone who is being teased or bullied. Did you have someone who stood up for you that you remember a moment? I did not have um, kids who stood up to me. I think I just had my little um, group of friends that we hang around. We we're all deaf, so if kids were making fun of us, you know, we really didn't know. Um, I, I did not um, that I can recall. What I do remember, though. Uh, very poignantly are the teachers who would reach out to me and talk to me and say, Hey kiddo, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm here for you. If you need to talk, you know, let me know if you need anything. A handful of teachers uh, reached out to me, whether it's before or after class. Um, so that, that definitely helped um, in schooling for sure. Did you Charms, didn't you? Wasn't there someone who was like mean to you in high school, and then later on you had you were like her nurse, and you were like treating oh her? Oh my gosh, you remember that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a good story. Yes. Yeah, so wow. Yes. Yeah, so hmm, a fellow student, yes, was not very nice, and one of the teachers recognized that. So when you're sitting in the classroom, she sat behind me, and she would plonk her feet on the, the stool of the chair. And obviously, you know, and I'm upset because she's, you know, making all this noise and I could feel the noise in the chair. She's vibrating the chair. So the teacher, you know, she'll be like, you're okay. I know she's, she's so mean. What next time, why don't you sit in, you know, on this side of the room or, you know, something to that nature. Um, but yeah, and she, she was horribly mean, but yes, um, it wasn't that she was my nurse, it was her dad um that i was the nurse and mm. what was funny was the dad would tell her oh my gosh this nurse she's fantastic i have the best nurse and so he would he pushed the call button and say nurse nurse can you come can you come so i would come in and this is a nurse i'm talking about and she turns around and she sees me wow i don't wow. look much different from high school and I could see the blood drain from her <laughs> face. Wow. And I just acted like, oh, hi, how are you doing? You know, your dad is going to be fine. He's in excellent hands, you know, things of that nature. But she was quiet. 
Wow. Uh, she wasn't mean or anything like that, but she just, I mean, it was like. Did you oh. want to kick her chair? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a um, story where, uh, so I had, in school, kids would not always be the nicest and they would exclude me and, and tease me and stuff. And so years later on Facebook, I actually got a, I posted something along those lines and somebody um, reached out to me who I'd gone to elementary school with. And she said, if I was one of those kids, I'm sorry. And uh Oh, that was um, maybe ten years ago. So yeah, that was pretty oh my amazing. Gosh. Yeah, Facebook is good for something. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's so, wonderful. Yes. Um, so we have a question from Lizzie Fu. Uh, so I have one for Charmaine and one for uh, Sarah, but I'll start with Sarah. As a sibling of someone with a craniofacial difference, does it have an impact? on the choices you make in your life? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it definitely does. I mean, I think the thing that's tough is when you're a sibling of someone who has a craniofacial difference, you feel like, wait, why was I born the way that I was born? And it almost feels like it was a fluke or you, you got lucky and you just feel like, you know, well, you know, something's going to happen to me. You just feel kind of worried something's going to happen to you. If you're everything that, you know, if someone tells me that I look beautiful, you know, so often the first thing I would think is, you know, what about my sister? My sister's beautiful too. You know, mm -hmm. like it would make me feel almost guilty um, to have people say those things or give me those compliments. And, and you know, I remember my sister's uh, speech at my wedding, which was, you know, she said, you know, you deserve love, you deserve happiness. And I think it just made me feel like, um, you know, I, I don't know, I just didn't feel like I deserved it. Um, and also just felt, you know, there's a lot of guilt and, and shame involved with that. And I think it's just made me incredibly empathetic. Um, I, I, I'm always, almost too much thinking about how this will make people feel. And um, I use that as a designer when I was designing websites and it, I use it, you know, when I'm making comedy, I always think about my words. I choose my words very carefully. I always, it's very easy for me, I think a lot because of my, my relationship with Charmaine to put myself in someone else's shoes and to think, well, mm -hmm. if, if somebody was, you know, experience, going through a hardship, would, it, would this be good if I made fun of this? Probably not, so I'm not gonna say that, you know? And so I think it it, it, it makes me a lot more aware of, of people's feelings. Yeah, that's great. It's interesting, because I have an older brother who I think um, is very aware and um, compassionate and um, caring of others. And, and I know even when I was growing up, he, um, you know, there are a couple of times where he had to defend me or, you know, um, on a playground or something. So I think, and it's interesting because I have a niece and two nephews, and I think because they've grown up with the fact that I wear hearing aid, I remember when I was, when she was about three, four years old, she would come and try to tell me a secret on my right side. And I was like, no, you gotta tell me on my left side. And she, so she'd come over and tell me on the other side. And then when I realized that the more I talked about my differences and made um, them aware of this, it just became a, a, a part of who I was. And I think, but because they grew up with me, I think they, I can see how much more compassionate and empathetic they are to others um, because, uh, and so aware um, of that. And I think, uh, it's true. I think it does help to do that. So, uh, yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I I did write this one joke about charms, which is basically that, you know, she is my biggest cheerleader. She mm. is the one who's always telling me, Sarah, you can do this. You can do this. And I and I kick myself because I'm like, 
I'm supposed to be telling you that, you know, and I'm complaining, oh, sis, I went to this open mic and nobody laughed at anything that I, you know, said. And she'll be like, it's okay because you just, you showed up and that's what's important, you know, but just once I'd like her to be like, sis, like I was born and I couldn't hear, like, and now you're making me wish I hadn't gotten that fixed, you know, (laughs) like. (laughs) Right, right, right. Uh, she's, I mean, she's a uh, yeah, huge inspiration to me. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, re- it's, it's really kind of reversed because I feel like I should be the one trying to inspire you, mm-hmm. sis, but you're the one inspiring me. <laughs> well, it sounds like you both cheer each other on. Yeah. And we're really supportive of each other, uh, which is really nice to see. I, I uh, try to, but I think that like, I think Charmaine also because she's older, she tries to, you know, I can handle it, you know, I can, you know, take care of everything. And, you know, the sign language thing, I'm still hung up on that, you know, it's, it's just interesting, because, you know, you, you didn't want to teach me sign language, because you wanted to keep something for yourself, that was just yours. But at the same time, if, if, if like, I had learned it, if, like, our whole family had learned it, we'd all be able to speak it and that would be that would have been fun you know i think what happened with the sign language again i was raised oral learn how to lip read our our parents were we're in a hearing world we're not in a deaf world so they did not want me to learn sign language they didn't i checked out a book it was called the joy of signing if anybody wants to learn sign Um, so you had to learn signing behind their back sarah well well okay yeah, over the summer, I, I, yes, yes. But they eventually wow. found out. They eventually <laughs> found out that I, I signed because they thought if I learn sign language and I'm going to be with my deaf friends, and I did have deaf friends and I had hearing friends, but they were afraid if I learn sign language, I'm going to be like this. We're in a hearing world, mm-hmm. and I'm like this. So they're trying I, to protect you. They're yeah. How yeah. am I going to? succeed in a hearing world if I learn sign language and they thought it would impact my grades, you know, things of that nature. But once they saw that I was ma- finally making the A's in mainstream uh, classes for B's and C's, but now all A's, they realized s- learning sign language is actually a, a bonus. Um, so it-, it had no impact at all. So, yeah. So if you met somebody who, um, a parent, um, who are deciding whether they should let their kids learn sign language too, would you say they should let their child learn? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I taught my nephew, um, my first nephew sign language before he could speak. So- Ryan, Ryan knows sign Ryan. language? Yeah, so milk, water, more, please. <laughs> Those are the words so that he can tell me what he wanted. I mm-hmm. want milk, water, more. The sweetest sign, this is thank you. And he'll be like this. You know, Aww. thank you. Um, so I taught him and he's he's a smart kid. So That's yeah, definitely. Um, and I think what people have to understand is back in the day, me being with Chicha Collins, we didn't have the community resources that is out there today. So my parents didn't have, you know, so su- there were no support groups. There was no my face. There was no, no my, my face. face. Right. Exactly. There's no my face, which, by the way, I didn't even know about until Sarah uh, introduced me to it, which I think is a fantastic organization. Nowadays, I can Google Teacher Collins and you see all this information and, com- you know, com- community support groups and resources out there. So there's there's so much out there today, but I didn't have that growing up. I didn't see anybody else. I think maybe one other person. Um, with Trisha Collins, my whole um, adult life, I only saw one other person mm-hmm. um, like me. So, yeah, it's uh, what's out there now. It's it's a lot. I agree. There's so much more information um, out there than when I was growing up, and I, from the support for parents now and for the kids. And and one of the things we do at my face is have these support groups now for the different which I think is so important. And I always say there's power in the shared story and knowing you're, you're not alone. And I think having that community is so important. So um, we have a question from Alana for Charmaine. Is anything or anyone holding you back or, or uh, was in the past? 
when I went to nursing school, so picture this, I'm deaf and I want to be a nurse. I actually originally wanted to be a doctor, but then I had a really bad experience with a med student. He couldn't find my vein or something. And the nurse was fantastic. She stuck me once and I didn't feel a thing. So that led me to the path of nursing. When I went to nursing school, that was not easy at all. We have what's called clinical labs, meaning you have to learn how to use your stethoscope. You have to learn how to take blood pressures, listen to heart murmurs, things of that nature. So each student has to do a blood pressure reading times two and get it correctly. All the students did. But when it came to my turn, they would make me take the blood pressure three times, four times, five times, six times, just to make sure I was really getting it, not just by chance. Um, so that was a challenge um, in college for sure. Once mm -hmm. they saw that I was serious about becoming a nurse and willing to study hard and made the A's on my exam, their, their whole personality changed. Um, mm -hmm. And they realized, huh, okay, she, she's, she's smart. I, I think she can, she can do this. And then that changed from then on. I think they just didn't know. They look at me, I'm deaf. I had sign language interpreters in classrooms. So in their mind, how, how can I be a nurse? You know, I'm deaf, I can't hear. I, I have to rely on a sign language interpreter. How's that gonna work as a, at the bedside? you know, things of that nature. So I think they just didn't know, but as time progressed and they saw how I was progressing and how well I was doing, then they realized, you know what, it's, it's gonna be okay. So um, I know that during the pandemic, you were working during the pandemic and I was wondering if you found having a facial difference impacted how you dealt with the patients in the hospital during that time? I think with wearing the mask, I'll have to be honest. It's almost like you're hiding my, I'm almost hiding myself a little bit wearing the mask. So I am less self-conscious when I'm wearing the mask. I'm like, hmm, wearing the mask, all you see are my eyes, that's it. But when I'm not wearing the mask, oh boy, I mean, my, my confidence kind of dip a little bit. I get a little bit more um, self-conscious. Sometimes I'll go to the grocery store and somebody would be staring at me and this overwhelming anxiety would take over and I would just leave my stuff and leave the grocery store. But wearing I, the I mask- have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, I've never, I've never asked you, I don't know if I've ever asked you this, this, but I've always wanted to know, like, when you meet someone, would you want someone to ask you about it? Or would you want someone to just talk to you like you're completely normal and not even, not even ask about it? Like, how do you feel about being asked about it? If it's coming from a good place, ask me. Um, I've gone on a date where, you know, the gentleman asked me, so I see you look different that that's it, it came from a good place and then i you know i told them about you know treats or collins and, and things of that nature so if it comes from a good place ask me mm -hmm. um it's okay to ask because if you don't know knowledge is power right so if you don't know how are you going to gain more knowledge yeah without asking questions you know yeah i always say that i think it's i think it's okay there's a time and a place to ask the question but i think it's okay to ask the questions yeah. because that's how you learn. And so much of what is, we feel what we don't know. So when we don't understand something. So I think, I think it's really important. So um, I'm just curious, what advice would you, and you almost could both answer this, but what advice would you give to your younger self knowing what you now know? Oh, wow, that's a great question. <laughs> Charmaine said the same thing when we were rehearsing. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what? She she told you she was going to ask you that question, and you oh, had the exact same goodness. response, which was, "Wow, what a great question!" Oh, and then you no, never I thought know. about it again. And, I, and then and then it went out out the out my head. Um, tell my younger self. Um, oh boy, 
um, just to just things will get better. I think when I was younger, it was really hard literally getting through the day, let alone an hour or something, because it's, it's just so painful to be different and you feel um, isolated just because of how people treat you. Um, just make get through the day. Um, it's okay. And ask for help and tell people how you feel. I'm not well, sure if I really communicated how I feel. My parents treated me like I, I'm a normal kid, which was fantastic. Um, what, what was it like? What was it like, you know, when, when like Rachel was born and then I was born, what was that like for you? When Rachel was born and you were born? I don't, see, I was young, sis. When Rachel was born, you mean as you a kid? You remember everything. Yeah, like, I mean, so all of a sudden mom has, you know, a new baby. Like, did you remember that, what that was like? And I remember, I, I, I love Dolly. So I remember just carrying Rachel around, you know, because she's my baby and I would just carry yeah. her around. I have a crazy story to tell you though. Oh Lord, I don't know if mom's listening, but I, <laughs> I, I don't know if it was Rachel in the, um, and what do you call it, the carriage or Sarah, yeah. but I took somebody, a baby out across a busy highway. Don't ask me how we did not get struck and killed. Um, and a gentleman noticed us walking down the street on a wow. busy highway with this baby in the stroller. Um, and he, I don't know if I told him where I lived or what, but somehow we made it back home. Um, and he was like, I think these kids belong to you. <laughs> I, wow. Yeah. I, I think you've taken both me and Rachel on adventures <laughs> many times. <laughs> so Sarah, what advice would you give to yourself now? Um, you know, I think, um, gosh, I feel like you know, I'm just, I'm just really like learning about my sister so much more, especially this is a great, you know, it's, 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 it sucks that it takes a podcast interview live with an audience for me to, you know, ask Charmaine questions that I've always been curious about. But I guess that's, that's what I would, that's the advice I would give is talk to your sister and ask her questions. You know, I just, I always had these ideas in my head of what it was like to be you, sis. And I, I don't think I really knew, like, and I don't, I'll, I'll obviously never know what it's like to be you, but I, I want to understand as much as I can. And I think um, not, not letting the time go by and asking those questions and really trying to understand where your sister's coming from, how she feels about you and let her know how you feel about her and just developing that relationship because it's, it's taken a long time. You know, I'm 43, she's 50 now, and we're having conversations that I feel like I wish I had had with her when I was a lot younger. Yeah. And also, also, I would say, make Charmaine learn, teach you certain sign language. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think I want to say I've always wanted to learn sign language and I just started doing it. So a few years ago um, at work, we actually had somebody come in and teach us sign language. But it's one of those things, I think, if you don't use it, you, you don't really remember it. So um, but I, I when I was younger, similar to you, Charmaine, I did teach myself the alphabet. I became kind of interested in it, and I started um, looking at books and teaching myself these things. So, uh, and I think, based on what Sarah you were just saying, I think uh, I think it's great that you think that because one of the things I think for me that was most challenging is that I was the child that said everything was fine, and I didn't talk very much, and I didn't say, and I think. Um, the idea that somebody would be saying, how are you, what's going on? And having that, I think is so important. So I think yeah. um, it's good advice. Yeah, I, th I think I really thought that Charmaine was fine. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was just like, oh, that's my, that's my older sister, you know, and, you know, I worry about you. Um, as I got older, I started to like worry more and just start to think about it more. But when I was growing up, I just, that, that's my older sister. And I, I was just trying to catch up to your grades. Like that's all I was trying to do all the time. Um, and that's all I, I was concerned about. Um, but, you know, to understand really like, you know, I, I always wanted to act and acting is about like taking on someone else's experience. And so 
I will never know what it's like to be Charmaine, but I've, I've always, I always want to know, you know, what, what that's like, you know, the feelings of isolation, the feeling like you're alone, you know, like wanting to ask for help, but not thinking that you should ask for help. You know, all of those, all of those feelings I think are so just, everyone feels those feelings, you know? And so it's talking is really a, a great way to connect. So even though we may not have, uh, spoken or talk much. I mean, we did a lot of fun stuff, you know, uh, when we were younger kids, you know, besides dancing and we would make skits, we would dress up like we're models and we, you know, walk down the runway. When dad got his camcorder, we'd be like shooting on the you know, cameraman and we're like taking pictures and asking Sarah to pose. So we may not have you know spoken a lot, but we did a lot of um, fun activities, you know. Yeah. For sure. Oh, speaking of dancing, there was one more question uh, up here about, you know, do you feel dancing yeah. has become an outlet for you? I don't. Did we ask that question? No. In fact, we did not. But that's it. Was a question somebody wanted to know. Yeah, exactly that. Was dancing an outlet for you? Uh, as a place when you felt empowered, and how has dancing impacted your life and your confidence? I love dancing. And as Sarah mentioned before, when I heard ABBA for the first time, and I wanted to be a dancer, actually, that was going to be my dream before I started having all these surgeries and being exposed to the healthcare field. Um, dancing is definitely an outlet. What's, what's interesting, I dance in my house, you know, I crank up the music and I dance and it just builds confidence. And I'm dancing in the car. If you, if you're driving down the, you know, on the road and you see me doing this, that's me. And I'd be like jamming to my, uh, to my music. Charmaine um, will join, she will join a Zumba class. And even if she can't work out, she'll just sit at her on her couch doing the like upper body part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like when I sprained my ankle, I couldn't yeah. fully participate in the Zoom. So I'm doing my upper body workout, so. I, I love dancing and yes, it's definitely an outlet and a great stress reliever um, as well, for sure. And if I ever, and if I ever go dancing with Charmaine, it's, it's <laughs> I don't like going dancing with Charmaine because everyone compliments Charmaine, everyone. Everyone's like, oh, look at her, look at her. I'm dancing right next to her. And people are like, <laughs> people are like no, we, this, here's the dancer over here. And I'm like, but I'm doing the same moves. <laughs> right, right, right. So, Guys, I feel like we could go on forever, but it's unfortunately time to wrap this conversation oh, wow. up. And it was, I know it really went fast, right? Yeah. Um, but it was really um, amazing to talk to you both. And um, hopefully one day we can do this again. But uh, really, thank you both so much for sharing so much of yourself today. Thank you, Dina, for doing this series. I think it's really awesome. You, you know, uh, just making everyone uh, aware of this organization and also just empathy, kindness, you know, like let's be kind to each other. Let's yeah. please be kind to each other. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And thank you. Um, it's really um, a labor of love. So, and it, I, it's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. So thank you. And I'm so glad that we have this, that Charmaine, you found a community um, and that we've been able to connect. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Um, um, so I'm hopeful that these conversations can help others better, better understand our stories while also creating a kinder world for all people with craniofacial differences. For 70 years, my face has been dedicated to changing the faces and transforming the lives of children and adults with facial differences by providing access to holistic, comprehensive care, education, resources, and support that pave the way for better outcomes. To learn more, please visit myface.org. And if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to My Face's YouTube channel to catch future live broadcasts of My Face, My Story. You can also listen to the audio recording on your favorite podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to receive email reminders of new episodes, sign up at myface.org slash mystory. 
That's myspace.org slash my story. Thank you.